I actually did want to be a doctor, but there wasn't much, there weren't many facilities at school for doing the science, and I was hopeless at maths. So I looked around for something else, and my father was a solicitor, his father had been a solicitor, one of my ancestors had been a judge, so it seemed lo logical to go into the law. And my father had a great ambition that his solicitor's firm could then be renamed Arden, Son and Daughter. There was lots of uh, sucking of breath, saying it's going to be difficult, you know, but uh, it was all about, well, you can be a solicitor, but you can't be a barrister, you know, people will never instruct you, and you'll never be able to get on. But, but and this is a big but. Uh, I come from the Northwest, and in our area we had a very famous woman advocate, Rose Heilbronn, and she was in the newspaper pretty much every day. And she was uh, very glamorous, she had a huge amount of um, charisma, she won a great deal of her criminal cases, and so there was a role model. By the time I'd finished four years in Cambridge, I decided I would like to go to the bar, so I plucked up courage to tell my father, and he was then enormously supportive. I went into company law, and that was because I had a very good pupil master, but at the end of the six months he said, you'll have to go somewhere else, which I did, uh, and eventually the chambers said, after all, we will try taking a woman. So they called me back, and I got a tenancy, but that meant I was a company law specialist. Uh, I did some other subjects, but n primarily company law which is certainly a male-dominated uh, field, but it's also a field where it's very cerebral. You're working out how you can do a transaction, whether a transaction will be lawful. Because in company law, people don't want to go to court. They want to know if they can do the transaction tomorrow. So you have to give them a, a reasoned answer in time for them to take the commercial advantage of doing the transaction tomorrow. So that suited me very much because I, in due course, got married and had children. I got married to another barrister, but we were in different fields. That's quite important. He was doing commercial law, I was doing company law. And it meant that I could work more flexibly. Uh, but, but at the same time, I think it was also easier for the solicitors because they could instruct me, but they never, they never had to say to the client, oh, well, shall we have a woman advocate? They didn't have to make that sort of choice. They would say, now we want a, a, an opinion on this, uh, or we want some drafting done, we'll send it to the council whom we normally use. And for a long time, I simply signed myself with my initials. I became a silk at a very, at a very young age, 1986, uh, and that, uh, as you know, is quite a risky business, but it didn't make any change, except this, it opened the door to travelling abroad to do cases abroad and giving advice abroad and appearing in court abroad, and I thoroughly enjoyed that. I believe in diversity of thought. My main interest in the law is the cerebral approach of thinking about what the law should be, how it should respond to society's needs, how it should move on when it's right for it to move on. Uh, and in that discussion, uh, it, there ought to be many minds brought to bear. Uh, and the research shows that if you bring many minds from different directions, whether it's race or gender or ethnicity or whatever, you get a richer result. And that's my view. It's putting several different minds together. And therefore, I very much encourage women because they're obviously, th although they're the majority in society, they're not the majority in the judiciary. When I first came into the judiciary, I found it extremely strange that I should be called Mrs. Justice Arden, because after all, Arden is my name, and I'm not Mrs. Uh, with my own name. Uh, and so I proposed that every judge, male or female, on the High Court should be Justice Arden. And I got the support uh, of several judges. But at the end of the day, I, there was too much resistance to any change. The men liked being Mr. Justice, and uh, some of my colleagues, who are women judges, I have to tell you, liked being Mrs. Justice, whether married or not. And I can recall being asked by a male colleague, and what is your name in your passport then? Thinking that he would be able to show that actually I accepted that I really used my husband's name. In fact, my, my name in my passport was always my own.
But there have been other instances too, if I can just tell you. Um, I, when I came to this court, the women were called Lord Justice. So, for Lady Justice Butler Sloss, as one would more naturally say, in court, the advocates had to refer to her as my Lord, my Lady Justice Sloss. And that continued, and women were sworn in as Lord Justice. So that continued until about seven years ago when we managed to, uh, or perhaps a little bit longer, the legislation was changed. It had to be specifically changed to say Lord or Lady Justice, and the women were then sworn in as Lady Justice. In 2005, Lord Wolfe asked me to look at the international judicial relations because with the separation of powers brought about by the Constitutional Reform Act and the abolition of the uh, Lord Chancellor's position of head of the judiciary, the judiciary then had its own power to direct its own international relations. So we could decide with whom to f promote relations in order to have benefit for our judiciary. The interesting thing to me was how often I met women in top courts. Uh, Australia, Canada, New Zealand all have about 40% women in the top court, uh, as uh, Germany has uh, that percentage too in the constitutional court. And in the United States, it's now one third women. So, yes, I was meeting a great, a great many more women, and they were surprised that there were so few of us. And I, to be honest, I found it very encouraging because I made good friendships with the judges overseas uh, and saw how they were making a real impression on their legal system. It's extremely important that people respect the rule of law and that the rule of law. Uh, continues to be as important in our society because people can then govern their lives, uh, can lead to social harmony, can lead to progress in society as well. So uh, you've got to think of ways of strengthening the judiciary uh, and my view about that is that you need to connect with people who are lay people. So I, I put together two books. Uh, they were origin originally one, but the publisher decided that they should be two. The first is about human rights and European law. The second book is uh, also a passion of mine, Common Law and Modern Society. I'm a great proponent of the common law. The common law will grow from strength to strength. It's historical, it builds on its experience, and it can adapt very swiftly, much more swiftly than a civil law system. At the end, I have discussed uh, the way forward. I've uh, used Tennyson's phrase about the old order changeth, and that deals with such matters as judgment writing style, trying to connect, the point I was making before, and also with the progress of women. I have to say that progress is not nearly as fast as I thought it would be coming out of university. I thought that uh, uh, the world was our oyster and it's not been. So I just would like the next generation to find it easier, to find it easier to balance life and work and family and work and also to make better progress in their careers.